Hello and welcome to Easygate Online Painting Club. I have never been so nervous in all my life. I have been working so hard for the last couple of weeks to get this all set up uh, and I'm still not entirely ready. Um, but that's, I suppose, the nature of show business. Um, I, this is a very, very humble setup uh, and I'm here streaming live from my house in a very, very uh, dingy, dark corner of the house in the middle of another UK lockdown. Um, so the first things first is probably you might occasionally be able to hear some sounds or some noises going on from the house. I am very fortunate to share my house with uh, three other people and a cat. I share it with my best friend who I've known since 93, which is going on near 40 years, or 30 years, not 40 years, aging before I get anywhere. Um, and our two partners also live here. So why we're not allowed out and about, people are going to be in the house. So if you do hear the noises, and we have done tests, it is quite difficult. But if you do hear it, that's just a part of the uh, raw and ready nature of uh, this show. Um, but I hope what we're doing tonight uh, benefits you in any way. Um, and please be a part of it. Um, so message in, get in contact with us on Facebook. And we're here. I'm here uh, for the next two hours. Um, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Um, and just to have a gaming club or a painting club um, for probably a good couple of years, but with work commitments and various other things getting in the way, that was never able to happen. Um, and with lockdown uh, during the pandemic, it's been pretty much the worst year that our generation have ever had. Um, it seemed like a perfect opportunity. So about halfway through the last lockdown, I started to kind of think about things and how I was going to do it and consider my the, the equipment that I would need. Um, and then lockdown ended. And I suppose I was just kind of putting it away for another day. I don't need to do it now. Uh, can't get back to life. And then here in the UK, of course, we are back into our second lockdown uh, and chats with my friends, my close friends and, and my and my family I all decided that now, is, if anything, was the time to provide a service to people um, and, and to kind of connect and bring the hobby together because our hobby really involves meeting other people and going out to places to go and play games and we just can't do that we can't be a part of our of our gaming networks we can't be a part of our gaming of our painting clubs so i thought that i would do my very best to kind of bring that to you um and if you learn something on the way that is going to be more than excellent that is not my initial goal all i'm really trying to do here is provide people with motivation uh to provide people with a little bit of company while they get through um the the, the problem that almost everyone shares in the gaming world, and that is um, getting your armies painted. Um, so I, I'm not going to be alone um, for the most part of the show. Um, I, I can have guests on at any time. So if you ever want to be a guest, that's something that we can talk about in the future if you want to. Uh, but tonight I'm going to introduce you uh, to my good friend, Kyle. I'm just going to give you a second webcam here. Kyle is on the screen. Say hi, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. <laughs> hi, Kyle. hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, Kyle has uh, been a very good friend of mine for the past three years now. It's been that long. Uh, we used to work together um, and after one day having a, a, a surf together, uh, we kind of just started discussing the game world and we realised that we both had the same interests and that was in tabletop game or well, games of any kind really, isn't it? It's been, it's been anything that kind of provides us with entertainment sat around. Anything with dragons, magic space anything, anything anything that surfers would normally laugh about frankly yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and, and we realized that we shared the same uh, passions and hobbies um, and it's been Kyle that's been a driving force uh, incidentally behind getting this up and running and realizing that actually what I wanted to do wasn't to provide YouTube short videos but was actually to provide a live podcast um, because it's very difficult to do short shows in a painting club um what you want to do of course is, is share your ideas um share the pain of painting um through massive amounts of gray plastic knowing that someone is on screen live with you there um might actually provide you with a little bit of comfort while you get through um some of the harder stuff um i can see that in the chat menu already i've got someone here called jeanette dean uh, evening dan um someone recognizes me thanks very much um if you are going to be with us this evening do you know drop in a like or a comment or even better follow and subscribe on facebook or on the youtube link um because every little bit helps i don't want to be that guy that says that hit the bell icon do the subscribe thing but if this is going to be a successful um, club, then every little bit will help. So I am going to be that guy. Please do like and drop in comments. That would be wonderful. Um, so let's talk about what this club, this online club is and what it could be. For me, it was just 
to start with, a way of just kind of providing a hub, a social hub for people to get together and to do the things that we want to do and kind of share ideas. Um, so it could be so much more. Um, maybe this goes really, really well. Maybe it flops. I hope it doesn't. Um, but if it, if it goes really well, um, it could be something that people are talking about in, in years to come. And that, that would be really, really ideal. And it can grow. And I don't just have to do one night a week. I can do different subjects and different videos, shorter, longer. I can do VIP guest lounges where we kind of all get together and have a chat. Uh, so there's lots of ideas there. What about you, Kyle? Have you kind of got any suggestions on what we can turn this into? Oh, so many things. There's such a scope of games out there as well as, as yeah. the painting needed for it. Um, I know we both got backgrounds in RPGs as well. We do. Um, and even just talking about concepts out there, getting away from like the metagaming of RPGs into actually role-playing. Again, I see a lot of metagaming in RPGs, and that could definitely be a, a direction we, we head off into uh, outside the painting world. Yeah, absolutely. This doesn't have to stay um, restrained, constrained. Sorry to the to the table where we're just painting. We can, you know, we sat around a coffee table talking about books. We can go out and, you know, go to con, you know, conventions and all sorts of stuff. Um, that, of course, is uh, not a pipe dream, but a much further away down the yeah. road. Um, so tonight, what I wanted tonight to be um, was to kind of just talk about um, the games that we play to start with. Um, you know. What, why why is this club important to me? What what do I want to do? I've got, and I'm sure every other gamer in the world has got this problem. So I've got a few painted models where I can see a progressive arc <laughs> through over the years that I've been painting. Um, uh, and then I've got immense stacks of unpainted plastic and it's doing my head in. I, I, it's such a chore to get through them all. Um, and they, I know that they're going to look epic, just, you know, whatever level my painting is, which isn't that great, by the way. Um, but it's just finding that motivation to get out there. Um, I, I don't play just one game. I play several games and I paint models for, for just the fun of it as well. So that kind of gets in the way and tie things up. Um, so f for me, it's about kind of reaching out and, and wanting to connect with other painters who I can get ideas, I can get tips um, and generally get um, my level of painting to improve um, because I want to be able to talk to people and you know get, get some styles and tips from, from people out there. Um, I'm not a pro painter. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time, um, but I'm by no means am I a good painter. That's what this 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 channel is not about um, a tutorial thing. I have done one tutorial, and that kind of spurred me on to do this. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about um, the person who helped me do the tutorial a bit later on in the show. Um, but I did a little tutorial on acid pooling for war game bases. And it went really well and it got put in a magazine and it's probably my highlight peak point in my life. Um, but I'm not a pro standard. I know a couple of tricks to make things look kind of cool, but I've got a lot to learn. So I'm reaching out, essentially. Kyle, what about yourself? I am the habitual grey army man. Um, I absolutely love the game and I love um, the fantastic miniatures they produce. And then you see them painted up by the professionals. And I think, yes absolutely want to do that and then all my motivation suddenly goes for painting um a bit of it is a little bit scared to not do well i'm a little bit of a perfectionist when it comes to it um so i kind of don't want to be bad at painting and build myself up uh, it's also not the cheapest hobby in the world uh, as we all know if, if we've been a part of the, the games workshop trend for a while yeah. um so for me it's about just finally setting some time aside knowing there's other people out there doing the same thing as me and to be able to ask questions uh, as i go yeah. I've painted maybe a couple of units in my entire time. I've played this since I was a kid, on and off, uh, when I've had the time to. And I've just always had grey or spray-painted armies. That was my go-to. Same thing. Ah, spray-paint them. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. So, so obviously, obviously, you're making a lot of reference here to Games Workshop. And the games that they... It's, it's the classic, isn't it? Is the is the um, Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000. And also, of course, now um, the main one is um, Age of Sigma, which I don't play. But I do like a lot of the uh, models. Um, I'm particularly into the big beasts that they do. So I have thought to myself, oh, I'd like to get one of those or one of these. And I'd like to paint that up. And my imagination goes crazy. And then I'm like, well, maybe I shouldn't buy any more <laughs> until I get at least through some of my substantial amounts of unpainted stuff. I've got a lot of stuff here with me in the room, which I'm going to go in a minute. I'm going to go to another webcam and I'm going to talk through all the things that I've got here. Um, 
But yeah, the games that I play then, the, my big one is Warhammer 40,000. I love it. Uh, it's, pop, it's the game that got me into wargaming, though a little bit before it, I was uh, into kind of collecting FX models and, and painting them. I thought I was a, you know, a wicked painter at the time. I was awful, but let's not go there. But I liked it, and that's what this hobby is. It's not about necessarily being the the, the best. It's about being the best that you can be and enjoying yourself. Um, so I got into 40K because my friends were collecting it and painting it. And, um, oh, I've got another person on there. Oh, that's my dad. Hi, dad. <laughs> He's saying hi. Um, so I started playing uh 40k with my friends because i started collecting the models because they were doing it i got into it and i, and I never stopped never stopped playing at all um so once i got into playing warhammer 40,000, i had a, a bit of a go at fantasy battle but i found that getting through the large armies in my early days of painting was just was just too much um so i, I didn't get into it and then of course a couple of years later they banished the game um so in some ways i'm kind of glad that i didn't get involved into that but i did like the miniatures and i did like the game I just never got into it. Um, and I also play um, several other games. I do collect bolt action um, tanks, and I've got some of those to show you here today, but I don't actually play the game um, because I have so many <laughs> um, collections of terrain and various scenics and models and things. I just thought that it was um, a game that, again, perhaps I should just get through what I've got, think about storage, think about painting and gaming, and then perhaps I'll go into it. But I do enjoy painting their models because they are they're a little bit like Games Workshop models in the fact that they're really clean and bold and just wonderful models to, to play around with. Um, I also play Gaslands, which isn't a game that miniatures are made for, but you uh, it's designed for you to go out and buy things like Hot Wheels cars. Um, so I've stripped those down and painted those up. And that is a blast. If you ever get a chance and you've not played it before, go play Gaslands. Uh, just for an evening and get your mates over have a beer or a brew or whatever it's, it's crazy fun um, if you get lots of you just go with one car because it's going to take you all night but it's hilarious fun uh, it's very very similar to x-wing uh, where you use like templates and kind of move around uh, but you get to do your own thing with your own models and very loose rules and it's just brilliant uh, and i also play um, 15 millimeter tank games uh, because the scenery is much easier to store, the miniatures are that much smaller, it's easy to get through them. And I've got some of those to show you here today as well. Uh, we'll move on to those in just a little bit. Uh, what sort of games do you play, Kyle, uh, war games wise? War games wise, I started with Warhammer Fantasy, and it is what got me in. It was my absolute love. There was something about feeling like a general pushing around units in trays that I just absolutely loved. Um, I got around that problem with big armies by just not painting them and just sticking to them spray painted yeah. after that i went into some of the more specialist games i really enjoyed more time um and necromunda when i was younger and even got into inquisitor which was the bigger scale and then yeah. i finally got into warhammer 40k which is kind of what i've stuck with um as an avid blood angels player i've dabbled in a few other armies because i get too many ideas uh, <laughs> yeah branch off and then come back to blood angels every single time because there's just something fun about jumping around a battlefield smashing people we're going to talk uh, about that later on yeah we're going to come back to that okay <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah I, my big love is actually the smaller the smaller scale games and we myself and danny and some other friends were in a big necromunda league recently yeah. that went on for quite a while which was supported by one of our friends uh, who ran it absolutely fantastically um and again didn't paint didn't no, paint up my game. And that was the and thing with like Necromunda. Eight people to paint, and I, I still do have, didn't make it. I do have a gang of Goliaths, um, and I love them. And I've not finished painting them. They're not grey. They're not grey. They've got about three colours on them. And obviously, because of work commitments, we were playing it at work. Um, it, it got in the way, and that, that is something that I'm going to admit straight up that that wasn't because of the whole grey plastic disorder that we all suffer from. Um, but it, it's. It, it was just tough to kind of do for me. But of course, the guy who was running it with us, our mutual friend Dave, um, had box sets and he is a wicked painter. I have not seen, I've not held models <laughs> with the detail that that man can paint things. It's, it's incredible. So he was just like, come along, set up your own gangs, use all my miniatures. So we kind of got into it. And that was a bit of a shortcut way around for us, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, Necromunda, Necromunda was, was, was good fun. Small gangs. 
a lot of people got involved in that who normally wouldn't be associated with games and it was a really good introductory game for people to it play it was a gateway game it really it was, was it really it, it was definitely the way to get sold in into the into this um <laughs> industry if you want to call it that um yeah so that, that that was great fun um did you mention any other ones in there necromunda um yeah more time inquisitor with inquisitor the big, that was the other one four millimeter models we Got played that it. with standard um 40k models um going down to um centimeters i think it was all centimeters to inches whichever way the conversion went at the time um and we really enjoyed that and that for me was an interesting game because that breached the gap for uh, from role play games to, to tabletop games and and it was in encouraging you in there to kind of have this um meta over the top this kind of storyline this plot line and discuss things and that was great um but we never really got into it because again we we, we were younger and the models cost a lot more money and it was there was a lot of um conversion which i was very not used to at the time involved in that game but it was a brilliant game i still have the rule book somewhere i i've got the rule book online and uh, I, the, the conversions i made were just dodgy they were just Warhammer 40k and Warhammer Fantasy stuck onto 54 scale models. Who but cares? I was young enough and it, it got them on the table and it did the same for me. It breached that RPG gap. Yeah. Um, we went, we ended up leaning quite heavily and house rolling a lot yeah. uh, to make it more of a role playing game, which you just did the battles on the table. Um, and then from that was the step into the more traditional Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and that, that kind of route in. So, yeah. Yeah, I've got a couple of guys here saying, uh, Adrian Dean, uh, greetings, good sir. Uh, good evening, Adrian, from, from across the Vale. Uh, I actually know Adrian, he's a good friend of mine, supporting me from the other side of the town. Thanks very much for coming on, man, and uh, please be a part of it all the way through uh, and, and drop in suggestions. We're going to be reading this as we go. We're not going to be talking all night. We're going to get into the meat and potatoes in just a minute, but I thought that today being the first episode, that it was just kind of really good to get you know our, our interests and how we kind of got involved in the games. I've also got uh, Ruben Garaby. I hope... I have pronounced your name right because I've never actually said it. We've only recently been connected. Ruben is the gentleman, um, uh, my my brother across the Great Pond, uh, is the gentleman who owns the magazine. I'm going to talk more about the magazine later on. Uh, He's the guy that, um, essentially, I'm going to use the term here, headhunted uh, my tutorial from a Facebook uh, page where I I put my my efforts up online. He spotted them and and asked me very politely to put... um, uh, put it in his magazine, and, and he did. And, and now I'm famous, and the power's gone to my head, quite frankly. Try and stop me, you can't. Uh, but, but Ruben here is saying that he, he's glad that we've mentioned Gaslands. Uh, he's heard about good things about that one. It's an incredible game. Uh, I've got a couple of cars down here in a minute. That one that I've started painting, <laughs> started painting, but not finished. And the other one is not started at all, which just kind of pays in tribute to what it is we're trying to do here tonight. Um, so yeah, those those are the games that I play, the games that you play. This um, evening could be, or well, this show could be for for anyone. It doesn't have to be that you play war games or paint models. It could just be, excuse me, it could just be that you um, have interest in, in in hobbies or even maybe you're a, a canvas painter. I don't know, uh, and you just fancy the company to get through monotonous stages of your work or whatever or perhaps you just enjoy the company of two guys talking about a sad little hobby that they do in the dark room it's entirely up to you uh everyone's welcome to come along so please do be a part of it um so i'm gonna move us over now kyle unless there's anything else that you want to say uh, there is just one thing i've got to apologize for my headphones they have broken just before we went on and they're horribly <laughs> lopsided and weird um i am aware we, of it uh, we have done so tech, many broadcast so. tests um over the past week or two um and everything has been a learning curve <laughs> uh the equipment has been uh, and once we got past it, it the tests were pointless and it was just time to go live and today things are going wrong uh, my remote <laughs> control for operating the, uh, the the broadcast is not working your headphones are breaking but ruben has just assured us that um the sound quality is coming through great because i was concerned about the quality of my microphone if this show becomes popular and i really hope it does um, then I will obviously invest in more things for the studio to make it look better, to make it sound better, and to generally just provide more, equi- uh, you know, more, more content for it. Um, it, for the most part, is just going to be me and Kyle when he's when he's here, uh, painting things go along and keeping that conversation going along is going to be important. So your involvement is is crucial to our success. Um, but you know. I'm not going to do that until we get a little bit further into it. So we'll, we'll see where this goes. We might only have a couple of uh, viewers tonight watching it, but it's going to be saved on YouTube. So if people want to go on there and, and have that reference, then then they can. 
The shows are going to be about two hours long because you can't really get much out of anything short of that if you're going to be painting. If these shows are too long for you, then feel free. You can leave and come back to it another time. Or if it's really um, annoying people, the length of these videos, too long, too short, maybe it's just right, again, drop it in the comment section on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, and I'm committed to... If I get inundated with messages, I'm not going to be able to reply to them all, but I will read them all, and I will take everything on board, and, uh, yeah, and, and, we'll, and we'll get through this, and we'll make this a collective thing. That's really what I want to do. So uh, I'm going to get my mouse because my remote is broken. Uh, well, it's not broken. It's just not doing its thing. I'm going to move us over to the workbench where you'll be able to see my lovely white hands. And here we are. Uh, you can see me up in the top corner, Carl up in the other corner, uh, and this is my workbench right here. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a lot of the models and paraphernalia that I've kind of got. Um, so I, like I said earlier on, I paint a lot uh, of different things. I try to paint a lot of different things. Um, I've got, here's a couple of models that I use for gas lands. So this is a typical Hot Wheels car. Uh, fresh out of its packet. Uh, I quite like this one, little um, VW Beetle design with porn written on the side of it. Um, what people do for this game is they tend to completely strip them down, first of all by removing the little rivets that are in the bottom. I think I have done this one. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. I think I have. So that you can remove all the components apart and then you can sand these down because these are die cast metal. Um, so you need to get them down really, really smooth. Use various grades of sandpaper. That's something that we can talk about in another show or another time. Is you know how to, how to get really good effects down from sanding. Um, and then you obviously because it's metal, you need to prime it, and then you can um, turn them into something looking a little bit more apocalyptic. So this one here is the first ever one that I ever did, and I did a lot of weathering. I removed the windscreen. It didn't have a, a um, a bonnet, or as they call it in the States, a hood, so that you got the exposed engine parts that come through there. Uh, there's a lot more that I could have done with this, um, but I was really happy with where I got. I went for like super rusty effects, and you can see various tones of browns and oranges under a really, really weathered sort of creamy white effect. Uh, Carl, have you ever painted anything like this before? No, I've never, I've never weathered anything. I've always gone for a crisp, clean approach in my modeling and something I want to get away with, uh, move away from. Cool. Yeah. It's weathering something that I got into recently within the past, I suppose, year or two, um, playing or not playing, but you know, building and, and painting a lot of, um, uh, bolt action tanks, and whatever, where weathering is kind of a, the appropriate thing to do. Uh, and I found the stuff called chipping um, solution or chipping fluid, uh, and it comes in various forms from various companies, and they're all really, really good. And essentially, what you would do is you would you would um, paint the undercolor. So in this instance, it would be the rusty colors. Uh, I used an airbrush, uh, which I'm getting better and better with, but I'm still not excellent with it. Uh, sprayed. Um, not too liberally, but a decent amount of this fluid, which is translucent, and it it pearls up, it beads like like water on something, and it looks quite unsightly. And you kind of just let that dry, and then you go over with your other colour, let that dry, and then you can come back with a with a water soaked brush, and you kind of just go mental with it, uh, as mental as you want to. Um, obviously, the harder you are with it, the, the more effects that kind of come off. Um, there could be a lot of people out there who are very used to. Um, uh, weathering effects can be teaching them to suck an egg, but there are maybe a lot of people out there who, who don't know of this substance it's called chipping fluid. Uh, it's also known as the the hairspray method, where hairspray apparently I've not tried it myself, but does the um, does the very same thing. So you can spray hairspray on instead of the chipping fluid, and you kind of get down there. I also put these little mesh bits in there. There is a trade secret about this mesh that I'm not going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about that another time, um, and I might even make that into a t into a tutorial. But there's a, a very special thing that you can do to make something that isn't made on the market ooh, um, to give your war games of any kind um, a really nice aesthetic touch so stay tuned for future episodes for that you can see on the front I've um, uh, put some sort of loose barbed wire wrapped around it with a, with a ram with some if I come in really really close um, some really badly attached <laughs> um, plastic tubing and sort of I-beam girder on there with some cocktail sticks or spikes. That's the bit that was kind of unfinished as this went. That grey plastic RAM front there is um, actually from my 3D printer. I am very fortunate enough to have a 3D printer. I bought it um, from a man who 
uh, was given it by someone who had a business that was failing and didn't know what to do with it. So I bought it off of him and learned a lot by having to completely strip it down and build it back up again. And um, yeah, I learned how to 3D print and what a process that was. This actual it isn't designed by me. I got this off of Shapeways, which is a, a website that you can go to um, and download for free, mostly um, other people's designs. Uh, you can then print them off. Um, some people ask for donations there are things out there that require costs and money but generally um, most of the stuff that the, the uh, content is on shapeways is just free and this one came as a, as a big pack of rams and, and things that kind of looked kind of appropriate and cool so that's that's gaslands then um i've seen people do um vehicles really really simple and really really pretty with some really nice colors and i've seen people go absolutely mental with some of the hugest war rigs from mad max and every time i see those things i'm like right well i'm just going to chuck my brushes in the bin because i'm never going to uh, achieve that level of, uh, of of proficiency um i've also got uh what have i got down here some bolt action tanks i painted these up as a project for my dad and I'm going to tell people uh, why a little bit later on in the show. Um, but my first ever Second World War tank that I ever painted um, was a Sherman. Um, a Sherman is an absolutely fantastic model to put together. Um, it, it was just worlds apart from anything I'd done um, from Airfix in the past. I know that when I made those Airfix models, it was a long, long time ago. Um, and maybe like, I don't know, engineering standards have come on such a long way. Uh, I had so much fun making this vehicle, putting it all together and then painting it. And as I was painting it, I had to learn how to use an airbrush properly. Um, I bought some special paints for it, um, which is modulation colors. So it came from a set um, where it has grades of different um, depths of colors. So right down from shadows, there's six colors in total. So almost imperceptibly dark green. It almost looks like a like a, a black all the way up to a really, really, really faint um, light green. Uh, and you just spray it in, in different areas. And this, that's maybe a subject I can talk about another time. Um, and then there's, there's lots of weathering techniques. Uh, I've learned a lot since I've made this model. Um, and I really enjoyed that one. That was that was absolutely cracker. I, I made this for my dad because um, I'll talk about it more later on, but for uh, promotional photographs and things like that. So I'm quite chuffed to have my stuff in um, other people's kind of adverts and things. I'm just going to move my lights because they're, my hands kind of get in the way. There we go. Uh, the second ever bolt action model I did was, um, was a Tiger Tank. Uh, again, a really, really nice model to put together. Um, I'm looking at it now under these intense lights and I can see like all my weathering um, tricks where I kind of put mud on there. I mixed paint in with a plaster. Um, oh, sorry, I hadn't mixed it, mixed in paint with the plaster so that when um, when it chips, I've only painted over it, you can see this kind of this white residue that kind of comes through, which I suppose you could say lends to the, the general effect. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's one of those learning curves, isn't it? It's got a bit dusty on this one. It's been sat in a workshop somewhere. Um, <laughs> there is one mistake. Uh, Carl, I know that you have an extensive um, knowledge of warfare vehicles. There is one thing glaring about this. Let's see how nerdy you are. I, I, I couldn't be offering it to you any easier. Can you see what the problem is with this tank? Is it that we're talking about main battle tanks when they have no use whatsoever in modern day warfare? A subject for another time. Clearly, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> clearly I've angered the beast. <laughs> uh, that, Danny I, knows it's one of my main bugbears. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Um, so it, this is uh, Tiger number 131. I didn't know at the time. Uh, and I do love tanks. And since painting this one, I have learned so much about tanks. Tiger 131, um, all numbers, I think, were generally exclusive. Uh, but 131 is a very, very famous tank. It is the only operational Tiger tank in the whole world. There are about five or six um, restored Tigers uh, that survived the war up till now. Uh, Tiger 131 is the only fully operational Tiger. It was... Uh, featured in the film uh, Fury um, alongside uh, the EZ-8, which is what this um, show is named after. Um, 
uh, the, the, the Fury tank, um, but it was also painted in in, in later later colours, which was obviously like the uh, the African core colour. So it was painted a sandy colour. Um, so I got that wrong. I chose those numbers <laughs> because they were small enough to get between those details um, without warping them, because I didn't know really how to manipulate. Um, transfers and stuff at the time so for any fans out there who know and love tiger 131 i'm really sorry um that is my fault but you know what i had fun making it um and yeah it can it can sit there alongside the other tank and then the other um model i painted for um bolt action was another tiger um, i was actually lucky enough to be given um, a few models, uh, but I say given, I had to pay for them, but someone was having a um, a clear out because they couldn't get through their stocks quick enough. So I was more than happy enough to part with my money to take on more plastic that I couldn't actually paint. Um, I got through this one only fairly recently. So this is one of my more recent works. I really like this. It, I got a chance to, to play with colors that I've not played with before. So the, again, this is a modulation set. Um, I don't know if my lighting really gives it away. No, it kind of does look. Lighter in the front, darker at the back. Uh, I had a lot of fun painting this one. Um, and there's a lot of weathering and grime. Yeah, I really, really liked it. And of course, this is the color scheme, near enough, to Tiger 131. So aptly, <laughs> I didn't name it 131 because I'm clever like that. Um, but hell, what, what can you do? So those are my tanks from Bolt Action. Uh, I say since painting those, uh, I've become quite obsessed with uh, Second World War tanks. I don't know what it is about Second World War tanks or just, just you know, armoured fighting vehicles or, or AFVs. Um, I suppose it's kind of my, uh, my, my passion, like people appreciate cars in the same way. Um, and very recently, I was very fortunate enough to go to the museum where uh, Tiger 131 is down at um, Bovington because I took my dad down there for his 60th birthday. It's a surprise visit. And we got to go up and um, actually touch the Fury tank, which is waiting for us outside. And then there was a display with Tiger 131. If you ever get the chance to go and see um, the, ti or the, or the tank collection down in Bovington, um, please do. It is... Even if you're not into that sort of thing, you're going to have a great time. And, and we had a wicked time. We got down there really early and we were there for the entire day and we still hadn't seen everything. Um, and the tickets that were sold to us down there are um, annual tickets as well. And it wasn't actually that expensive and we had a great time. Um, so, yeah, that was that was uh, th these co this collection here. Um, I've got a box with some other smaller tanks in, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Um, let me just put these aside here. And we'll talk a little bit later about Kyle's revulsion <laughs> for main battle tanks. I like battle tanks, and I know that they served the purpose a long time ago, so I, I'm an advocate for them, but Kyle does not. So, <laughs> moving over to uh, Warhammer 40,000 then, which is my main uh, game that I play. I haven't played 9th edition, which is the most recent one. Um the most recent edition to come out uh i play very specifically space marines or tyranids tyranids is my biggest um war game love affair i love them i love the alien aspect my favorite movie is aliens i think it's wonderful and it just paid into everything there uh, but i don't just um play tyranids as i say i play also space marines this is one of my earlier models i'm gonna take them off the stand so i can fit them in front of the webcam again it's a little bit dusty I only dusted them off the other day. I've got a very dusty house, apparently. Um, so this is my uh, Storm Talon gunship. Uh, this was a really, really nice model to put together. It was chunky. Um, it was just fab. Um, and I play Raptors Space Marines, which have this lovely little icon here. And I got these transfers from Forge World, the wonderful. This I regard as one of my finer models up to the time where I painted it, um, along with a Dreadnought in, in exactly the same style. Uh, and it does the job. It's um, it's it's clean whilst not being what Kyle was suggesting earlier on, which is like super clean and super pretty. Um, but I, I I like the overall aesthetic and it's nice and simple and it does, doesn't have too much. Less is more. I'm a big advocate of less is more. But it was the first time that I'd actually played around with magnets. So the Storm Talon gunship, um, most people out there who played this game will probably know the Storm Talon has different weapon pods that can be attached onto the sides. Uh, and I didn't want to be um, controlled and manipulated into having just one choice. I wanted them all. So I put magnets in there and kind of taught myself how to deal with the problems and the 
intricacies of doing that and they're really quite sturdy magnets and I love them. However, though I do like my paint scheme all in all, I do feel that I have progressed as a painter. And um, one of the things that I want to do as a part of this channel is is learn to just get better and make that more like uh, the tigers and, and with the weathering uh, and, and features that are on them. And even though I probably the next time I do another tank, I'll, I'll be even better because you learn something all the time. I'll, I want to apply those skills and techniques that I've learned on those tanks to make these ones look grimy and, and weathered and stuff while still making those kind of colors pop and bring them to life on the table. Um, I've got a dreadnought um, as well that's in a box on the side. I'll, I'll pull that one out in a bit and we can have a look through that one as well. Um, and I've also got a collection of Tyranids. Now, my Tyranids uh, are everywhere in this house because over the years, I've just picked up whatever I can from anywhere. Um, I've got here um, a Lictor that was one of my, I used to think that I was really good. Uh, people used to think that I was really good. And I found this one the other day and went, goodness me, this is a Lictor from third edition. I don't know what year that was. Um, but this is uh, some very hazardously painted green with some yellow spots. I remember regretting that the moment I decided to paint 40 Gene Steelers um, with some black that's poorly dry brushed with grey and blue to kind of start contrast that and some really poor basing. Um, but I loved it at the time. Um, but I have, I have come on a lot further than that. And every time I paint a miniature, I go, oh, the last one was rubbish. The last one was rubbish. I've also got, oh, excuse me. I've also got a Red Terror. Um, I dropped him on the way down to the studio. He's missing a claw. Um, again, I thought this was brilliant at the time. Um, I, I don't like it. This is the metal one. I know that they do a fine cast resin one now. Um, so I might repaint these. I probably will repaint them. Um, but I've got to strip them down because they're, they're in metal. Um, I've got various Khan effects. I was lucky enough to buy... Um, Tyran effects from eBay from a guy who didn't want it and put it together badly and I had to kind of break him down and stick things all over him so he's got some weird tentacles sticking out of holes where bits and pieces like spikes and stuff came out of him I've used this one as a test uh, piece because he's nice and big and bold to practice a new color scheme which I will show um, as the main feature of this show tonight um, so yeah I've got I've got so many Tyranids um, coming out of everywhere um, and some, you know, other fine sculpts. I've also got with me here, get a little brush to kind of give this one a, a dust off because this one seems to attract all the dust in the world. I have living in my house a lovely little cat who has so much white fur, it sheds everywhere. Um, I love it a bit, but I do get fed up cleaning up after every 30 seconds and it sticks to everything. This is my acid pool that I did as a part of the tutorial um, for the magazine that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and I've started to put this on a lot of my new Tyranids. Um, you can see uh, the tutorial that I did. It's actually on Facebook on a, on a Tyranids forum, on a Tyranids page out there. Uh, but I'm also going to talk about a little bit later on about the magazine uh, and where to find that and how to get there. And then the step-by-step the -step process is also on there. But this um, is probably one of my more finer uh, moments in terrain making. Absolutely love that. Uh, Kyle, have you done much in the world of terrain making, painting, etc.? Absolutely zero, in fact. Uh, it, I literally never went past spray painting my armies just so they weren't grey. I probably should just play grey knights to get away with it, actually, all those years ago. Um, and also, I just want to point out, Mellowbrook111 has just uh, pointed out how old you are. Oh, dear. Oh, I, I see. Yeah. Third, third, third edition was 1998. Was... I don't yeah. even really remember that. I think that was the year that I left school. Um, yeah. Yeah. Tyranids coming so, out of everywhere, says Adrian. Uh, sounds a lot like my guard. Yeah, I, it's like I said, I do actually know Adrian, and I've, I've never known anyone to own as many miniatures for one army as that man. I've actually seen him, and, and he deserves those bragging rights, but I've seen him bragging on um, Imperial Guard forums on Facebook, people thinking that they've got more than him, and then him putting them down. <laughs> quite carefully but yeah so um that yeah those, those are my armies i've got so many more models here that i could show and tell and talk about but obviously what we want to do is we want to kind of um get on um 
with the meat and potatoes of this show, and that is, of course, the painting. So, Kyle, I've been talking for a long time. My mouth is going dry. Um, tell us a little bit about what you've got with you tonight for painting, please. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually only going to focus on a couple of miniatures at a time. I'm at the point where I'm pretty much a brand new painter, even though I've been in this hobby for 20 plus years on and off. Um, so I'm just going to try and focus on a couple of models uh, and a couple of techniques at a time. Uh, just try and pick up my own brush handling skills and build up those techniques that I just am not very good at, I'm not very sharp at. Um, so I've actually got some high elves that were actually just completely given to me. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring you in for a closer camera, mate. Here we go. Nice. And move back over to your webcam. Yeah, let's have a look at that. Go nice. on, give us a show. I don't know if they'll come up great, but I just got given um, a box set of high elves because someone had got the, I think, I've forgotten the name of it now, Spire of Dawn, maybe, uh, which that was the sounds... Skaven and high elf sort of starter box that came out. And they just didn't want the high elves. Um, and I'd happened to mention to my brother that I really liked high elves. He spoke to his friend and his friend was like, just have them. Didn't want any money. Didn't want any beers for them, which is. Maybe we should all know who this friend is. Please yeah, do give I us will. the contact details. I feel terrible for not being able to give you the name for a shout out right now. Um, but I will get it because it's definitely worth sure. a shout out. I mean, a shout out, not because we all in the world want to get free <laughs> models from him, but to, you know, pay kind yeah, to the generosity, exactly. I suppose. Yeah, great, that's, that's really cool. Um, so, what I like about the high, I've always loved high elves. It was one of my first fantasy armies. I've just always liked the aesthetic of high elves. Um, but what I really like about them for my own painting going forward is it's going to have cloth to paint. It's going to have armor. It's going to have weapons. Sure. So it's going to teach me to build up a few different techniques. And cool. there's enough double ups in the box set that I will get to sort of paint them now. And then I'm going to paint them again a little bit further down the line and just look at my progression. Uh, That's a really good idea. See, yeah, I hope to see myself come along. Cool. So, um, we'll so I mean, what we can do... What I, what I really want to do is to set up uh, some galleries on the Facebook page, uh, which I want to be the kind of the main platform for sharing and in interacting. Um, so what we'll do is we'll set up some galleries uh, for people to put their images up. So if you want to you know, start one off for yourself about um, progression and, and how you're improving as a painter, then you can put up the, your photos of like a now and, and, and then or yeah however it is like because yeah in the future it'll be now versus then and you can actually display to the world how how you've improved it'll be really interesting to see um i can i can do that now um, with some of my tunes i'm gonna get my brood lord out in a moment and i'm going to show you which is probably the best tyranny i've painted um compared to uh this uh fellow that i've got the lictor here um so yeah we'll be able to see straight up how well i've so I'm actually a bit nervous. I've never held them side by side. And if they look very, very similar, I'm going to be like, maybe I should. <laughs> maybe I peaked years ago. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this show. Let's, let's see what happens. Um, so, yeah, so th this isn't a horde army for you, is it? This is just a couple of individual pieces uh, and focus on painting them. Yeah. So my idea is get myself a little bit better. I just want some practice before I move on to my main army, which is Blood Angels, which is a quite a different style of painting. But still, um, I'm going to use a lot of similar colours so I can start to build up sort of my palette, work out how colours go together. Because that's something I've always really struggled with, is actually knowing what colours to use with what. It's a, um, it's what a really good. important lesson that I've I've started to really get into um, in the last, I say probably about a year, is, is the colours, the palette that you choose and the composition of your model. Is a, that's, that's a term that I would have never have used um, up until recently is, is composition. It's so important. And I still don't know everything, but it's like creating a photograph in some ways. It's, it's, it's really quite interesting. And once you get it, it looks epic. It looks really, really good. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be quite unashamedly getting colours wrong to start with. And, yeah. and I've got to be OK with that. Like I say, I can be a bit of a perfectionist and I've got to put that to rest and just practice and be OK with things clashing at times. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you just got to get more. paint on a model, right? exactly for and me oh go on carry, carry on you say because i'm not too fussed about actually putting these these are old high elves with uh that aren't really a part of the new age of sigma line at all right so i'm not fussed if these don't see the table these are kind of just for me and, and get trying to make painting a hobby we've we've, we've all got we've all got models that we don't use i mean these bolt action um tanks that i've got here i don't use them for anything i just had fun painting them up and i gave them to someone so yeah okay i'm going to move back over to the workbench then so we can focus on uh, the stuff that i've got here um for, oh, for I, me I, sorry Dan, i did forget to mention as well it'd be lovely with the facebook gallery if you're just putting up what you're painting this evening um, this is meant to be a painting club after all not just a tutorial and that's a great idea doing their own things and it would just be absolutely lovely to see that 
knowing that there are people out there from from tonight with us. yeah from, from tonight i i will do the same and if people are out there watching uh, yeah by all means drop in photos uh, we'll set that up as as we go along drop in photos of what you're doing it doesn't have to be a finished item either it can be this is about painting club like kyle says so you know show us show us your current works and progress your wips so for me tonight what i'm going to be getting on uh, with is um i because i play tyranids it's a horde army I'm going to be painting uh, an apocalyptic number of spore mines. Now, if you are new to this hobby or you don't know much about Tyranids, you probably do because Games Workshop is uh, a prolific company. Um, But the Tyranids are an alien locust, so to speak, really. They kind of arrive in space outside your planet uh, and in a very hungry fashion start to devour everything that's on it, uh, consume it all as biomass, and then move swiftly on. Um, and th- well, the initial things that they do is they just launch billions upon billions of these floating brain mines that are about the size of a you know, small adult. Um, and they basically just kind of drift around. And if you get too close to them, they get attracted to movement or sounds or proximity, whatever. And then they explode and pretty much kill everything. Uh, spore mines are some of the smaller mines that they do. They do go up to much, much larger ones. Um, and I've got some home sculpted ones for larger ones as well. Uh, but this is obviously a horde army. Uh, and the main problem that I've got, and I, I do see a lot of other people can, you know, struggling with this, and that is ha- it's the opposite problem to what Kyle has, and that is um, batch painting large amounts. And it's the, one of the main things that puts me, and I'm sure probably a lot of other people as well, puts people off of painting. So nothing ever gets done. So maybe you're a, a horde army painter as well. If you are, you know, tell us your your tips, your tricks, and you know the ways that you solve these things. Do you set up a manufacturing line sort of process, or do you go, I'm just going to do these four here, and I'm going to get these done, and then I'll move on, move on, or do you do just one at a time? Um, I suppose there is a total amount of painting that needs to be done. Uh, so it's not necessarily about what order is the best maybe it's just the best for your mindset and for me i'm going to go through uh, i literally just uh, primed these before the show um i've done a pretty good job on that actually i've chosen white as a primer so that i can go with my yellow color scheme um and i'm just going to start working my way through them uh all together so i'm just going to work my way through the colors and through the schemes um and in and hopefully um maybe not by the end of the night because we've done a lot of talking already but maybe by the end of the week i'll have these done now i've got down here a box full of other miniatures and in here even though i was using that tyrannifex cheap model i bought off of facebook sorry off of um, ebay i did complete very recently a brood lord and it is my favorite tyranny model i've done i'm very very proud of it i've like i say i'm an excellent painter um but i was very very pleased with how he came out uh this one is the first of my tyranids to actually use the acid pool um technique i'm, I'm getting in the way of all my light here um uh, th- there are some photos of this bad boy on the facebook page um i, I can do more if people are interested um, and I, I kind of just learned as i went along and made it more shiny and glossy and there's lots of depth to those colors i think my lights are bleeding it out quite a little bit and i've also got a little ripper in there as well rippers are you know dog-sized aliens that have a voracious appetite and they eat everything and then throw themselves suicidally into these pools of acid and melt down which then just becomes a giant biomass soup that the alien ships just absorb and suck up through giant straws which i think this thing that's protruding out of the acid here i think that's actually a a small straw growing um but this is the color scheme that i want to get to so i've kind of got this gray carapace on the top uh, and i've got this this yellow flesh scheme i got this scheme um from an image i found on the internet when i was trawling for inspiration from a i suppose what would you call it a cute nids picture of a little yellow and gray tyranid smiling and he was very cute and charming and i thought i was talking to my dad at the time who's also a painter and i was like these colors really work you know normally i don't like bright colors on tyranids as a personal thing i thought and i quite like the the darker colors like the greens and things because they're more animalistic um but actually these colors really really work so i did a, a quick hormogaunt which i've got here as well 
Um, and as the model was also, a, the, the picture of the cutenid was also a hormagon. Um, it was a great thing to test. Again, there's some pictures of these ones on Facebook as well. Uh, these ones really came out really well. Let's see if I can get some light and focus in there. Um, so yeah, instantly I was sold like, yeah, this is definitely the way to go. And on the smaller models, I can just basically do a simple yellow color, uh, a simple, you know, shadowy gray color on there for the carapace and be done with them. I got quite involved into making those hormigons. Hormigons, by the way, any um, Tyranid uh, fans out there, hormigons are my favorite uh, unit ever. I think they're wonderful. Um, but again, it's a horde unit where you need to have, you know, you, you ideally want to be fielding 20 to 30 of them at a time minimum. So if you want to have multiples of that, it suddenly starts to become a bit of a problem. Um, so yeah, these are these are some of my miniatures. I'm not going to be going to any great deal of effort to get these spore mines looking like the quality of this broodlord um, because he's obviously sort of a, a character uh, model where I want a bit more focus kind of put on him as a general art piece so I'm not going to do like acid pours on them but you can see on some of them I've got some you know rough terrain bits and things where I've just tried to hide bits of the stands that they were kind of sticking on and also just to break them up and make them all look a bit more unique and they are all fairly individual so i'm going to go for a yellow um flesh on them i'm going to make the tentacles pinky because i think pink is a good color for tentacles um and then if they got carapace bits on them which some of them do let's find a good one here's here's a good one it's got a little bit of carapace just at the top up here hopefully it's going to come into focus there he is not doing a very good job of that it's my first time broadcasting you can tell can't you but he's got a little bit of uh, carapace just there i'm going to paint that gray um, and these models, this is where I started to learn about composition, where, the, where your eyes are instantly drawn to the yellow and the greys all kind of blend, but they all kind of stick out in their own different ways. And I, I was just super happy with this guy. Absolutely loved him. It took me a long time to get through him, but, you know, get, get through him being done. But I was, I was just dead chuffed with him. So, yeah, that's basically what I'm going to be doing tonight is, is painting. What paints are you using, Kyle? I am building up reds on the cape. So I'm trying to work out how to do cloths, basically. I've, it's something I've always struggled with, with sort of highlight and shade. So I'm going to play around with red again, just getting used to using those Blood Angel colours. Um, good old Mephiston red as a base, which is a staple for any Blood Angels player. <laughs> it's all my water is already red um, as well, which we'll be used to. Then I've got a couple sort of layer colours. I've got some Evil evil Sun Scarlet going down to some oranges. and have got some Fire Dragon bright just to really uh sort of final highlight it i'm also gonna go some greens on the airline reaver that i've got um which were the greens that i got for a tau army that i never made out of black may, never made it past the black spray paint stage right i think they only took to the field twice they were an ebay special I managed to get sort of a good size army for a, a pretty cheap price um and i I wanted to play a different style from my Blood Angel, so I was like, yeah, I'll go for a Tau gun line. That'll be absolutely fantastic. Completely different stages of, of the fight I'm not used to. And it turns out, actually, I really love charging at things uh, and just trying to smash <laughs> them in the face and run away again. So I ended up uh, getting bored of the Tau quite quickly, unfortunately. It was a shame, because I played you with the Tau, and uh, you, you were a pretty good Tau player when you did. But uh, yeah, you are definitely a better Blood Angels player. Um, um, I at this point, I, I rarely win a game uh, because I just don't put my armies together to win, I find. Um, I prefer to try and make a narrative when I play. And, and that's the same with me. Doing something cool. Yeah, um, and... I'm not... I'm not necessarily in it for the competitive gotta win, gotta win. I'm in it for the enjoyment of playing a game. And sometimes um, an epic victory is better even than an honourable... Sorry, uh, an epic loss is better than a than an epic win by any stretch. Um, I don't think I've ever beaten you with my Blood Angels, but I've had some absolutely fantastic games. Did you not um, beat me the, the time when you did the assault... With said that we're going to mention it later, but we'll talk about it after our break. But the, um, the assault from behind... Uh, with the, the jet <laughs> pack did you not win that victory. one i think I, I would have won the war uh if we'd carried on playing um but i think i failed at the objectives and by failed at the objectives i mean completely ignored them and and just tried to smash off the table <laughs> uh which is my main tactic whenever i play um but yeah we definitely went home and celebrated that night even if we didn't quite get the victory <laughs> yeah. and how do they celebrate in a monastic fashion and going and doing some drill training and 
prayers and Defin- stuff. Definitely not praying to the blood god. Uh, I mean the emperor. <laughs> yeah. um, the blood god emperor. The blood god emperor. The blood god emperor. So I um, am using... Uh, I'm not using Citadel paints today. Well, I, I do use some Citadel paints, but... Heresy. The, yeah, I know. Uh, and I, I've got to give credit to um, Citadel paints um, because over the years, they have improved immeasurably. They are fantastic paints nowadays. But I remember when I first got started in this, the pots were so hard to open that sometimes my hands would bleed. <laughs> Maybe I just was too new to not really know how to kind of look after them properly. Um, but the paints were often thin. The pigments weren't great. Um, I know I was a beginner at the time, but nowadays the paints are just wonderful. They're creamy, they're smooth, uh, and the pigments are wonderful. And the, and the colour ranges are just wonderful. Um, but I use um vallejo paints now um i still do use citadel paints uh this is the game air range so this one is specifically designed um to go through an airbrush um it just means that the consistency of it is a much more thinner um, when i first got my airbrush i thought i was using these i was not and i was getting a lot of clogs all the time uh, i did a bit of investigation got these ones and they just go through they've got a consistency of milk so they're very watery um, but that doesn't stop you from using them with a brush um, I do actually have um, the brush version of this colour because I, I do a lot of application with brush on these tyranids as well. Um, but when I did the acid pooling, I actually did that all with airbrush paints because I want a lot of translucency in my colours and I really use that to kind of help me get that effect. The colour I'm using is gold yellow. I did know what colour that was because these um, game air ranges actually are designed to um, not copy or emulate but try to get as close as they can to a lot of other um, large producers of colors out there um i can't remember what this one matches up to maybe well no i'm not even going to say it because i know they changed their colors a long time ago and i didn't keep up with that at all um <laughs> i did however recently try contrast colors um and my mind was blown contrast colors i believe were um designed so that you could just kind of the idea was that you could just slap the paint on and kind of get your miniatures painted. Um, but with a lot of control, you can really get some wonderful um, colours and shades and techniques out of these. What I, When I put this, I just gave it a test. I bought it after I'd started doing these ones. Um, and where it kind of runs into the recesses, it becomes a little bit more concentrated. Um, it's... The, the, the colour was just absolutely fantastic and it was everything that I wanted from this yellow but when I stand it beside my other models I don't know if my lights are going to bleed out the effect too much here but the uh, the colours are totally different and I didn't want anything to stand away I want to be able to improve my painting without actually having my colours drift over the time so that that was important for me so I gave my yellow to a friend um, my, my contrast yellow um, and I'm going to stick with brush painting with the colours that I know however we have talked for a very, very long time. I expected to be painting by now, but first first episode excitement, right? We're going to have a short break. Uh, we'll come back in about 10 minutes. So an opportunity for you guys, if you want to, to go to the bathroom, grab yourselves a fresh brew. I know I might grab a fresh one because I'm through this one already. Um, and then I'm going to come back and I'm trying not to talk too much without doing any more painting. I at least want to get all of these yellow by the end of tonight, maybe even with... Um, a stain wash on them as well um, but that will be for in just a minute so without further ado I just want to say as well thank you to Adrian for putting up a, oh. a good little combo for painting red as well thank you very much oh wicked well we'll go through those in a minute when we come on back so uh, I'll take us over to an intermission where I've lined up some cool jazz for you guys I'll see you guys in a bit
And we're back. And my microphone was muted, but hey. So, um, I've come on back to my workbench. I've dug out my paints. I'm going to get cracking on with those in just a moment. But I did say um, before we left that I was going to do some shout-outs. Uh, there are two shout-outs that I want to do today. Uh, the first one is to Ruben Garaby. I've already mentioned Ruben's name earlier on at the beginning. Uh, Ruben is a, is a lovely guy who I recently actually spoke to for the first time. Uh, he is the gentleman who found me on the Tyranids channel uh, on Facebook, where I put up my little um, acid pool basing uh, tutorial. Uh, and he very kindly um, got in contact with me directly and basically said, uh, hey, we absolutely love your tutorial. Uh, do you mind if we use it in our magazine? And I was like blown away. I was like, yeah, I'm going to be in a magazine so that I became famous. Um, uh, so Ruben has his own magazine uh, and you really, really should go and check it out. Uh, I'm going to shout it out all the time on every episode in the future um, because it's his personal project. I think there's just him and his friend and I think his wife does a little bit in it as well. It's a really, really professional magazine and it's called Hostile Galaxy. It is not a paper magazine. It's only online. Um, you, I think you, you might have access to his website. Uh, when this video is over, I'm going to go over to YouTube and I'm going to put in all the links that you need to be able to, uh, to use to find Hostile Galaxy. Um, it's a really good magazine. It's really, really professional. It's not just about war games. It's about everything hobby related and even goes into cosplay. And this is some fantastic stuff. And uh, to be honest with you, to be even included um, in a magazine with the quality of work that has come out of some people, to, to, to stand up on, on that podium um, is probably my greatest hobby achievement um so thank you ruben for i know i've said it to you a hundred times already but thank you so much for putting me in that magazine um with so many other wonderful painters hostile galaxy you should definitely go over and check it out it's a wonderful magazine and then the other one that i want to shout out for it's a bit closer to home so of course i'm going to give this one a shout out it's to my father's company uh my dad is one of the reasons that i got into uh, war games and model painting uh he has a company called purple lion creations and has been doing it i think since before i was ever alive uh, in the last few years has actually turned it into a proper business he has a website uh purple lion creations.co.uk i believe it is uh very very active on facebook is on there every day talking to his customers and what he does is he actually makes uh, buildings and terrain for people for their war games um he's a bit on the higher price side of it because all of his buildings are one-off creations they're all custom built and bespoke i've actually got um a model here just one that he had in the workshop that he was practicing on um and this is a, one of the main things that he does. I'm just going to clear all of my tyranids out of the way in a scooping fashion. Um, the, I don't know if they're actually going to fit in frames. They're actually quite large. Let's have a little look. I'm going to head on over to the workbench, Kyle. Here we go. So this is a section of river with a little bridge. Uh, I love it. I mean, it's wonderful. Uh, so it's all custom built. Uh, and the idea, the concept with this one is that on the ends, there are little magnets... Um, and then you would basically order from him um, section, you know, as, as many sections as, as you would require. And you can have them all custom designed and built. And you go, I want a bridge or I'd like roads or whatever you want. And then you can fit them together in whatever unique way you like. Uh, and these ones are, I do believe, designed for bolt action players specifically in mind so that's why i made the sherman for was to advertise on bridges and roads etc um uh, even though they are custom built and they're all uh, bespoke often made from cards and, and, and other delicate features uh, he's gone to great lengths i've been in the workshop with him he's gone to great lengths to make sure that they're actually quite sturdy um <laughs> don't tell him even though he's watching right now i dropped this one earlier on and a little cry came out of me when i did it um and it is not marked at all i'm very very glad to say um but so they, they are super sturdy um they're, they're designed with a war gamer in mind as well um uh, he sells to all over the world uh, as far out as in the outback of australia uh, right over onto the um you know western side of the states ev everywhere um so if you're interested in just having a look or even making an order go see my dad over at purple lion creations so yeah there we go shout outs if you have projects that you want shown on this program then i will absolutely um give you a shout out i don't do um paid sponsorships or ads or anything like that so i'm not going to ask for anything for it uh, this is about a community and it's about a hub so if you want to um 
you know, have something on here, you've got your own little company making miniatures or terrain or whatever, by all means, drop me a comment, drop me a message or whatever, uh, and I promise I, I will give you a shout out. Cool. Um, how's the painting going, Kyle? Yeah, it's getting there. I've uh, just been layering up. I've actually hit a slight snag. Just looking at Adrian's way of painting red, I definitely had the Carlsberg Crimson somewhere from painting Blood Angels. I was either stealing it from a friend at the time or I've left it there. So I was thinking of just going with a classic known oil just to darken it down and go from there. Sure. If anyone's got any ideas of where to go with it, I've got um, a sepia and an earth shade as well. Um, if anyone knows, that's one of the things. I never know what inks to use uh, and what for. But I also thought if anyone is painting at the moment along with us, it'd be great to chuck it in the comments. Or if you're not painting, what's on your list? What's coming up next for you yeah, guys yeah, to, yeah. Uh, to be painting? Absolutely. And of be course, great. we want to we see those photos as well. So, you know, later on, maybe drop it. We'll, we'll create an album on the Facebook. Yeah. And we want to see what you're doing. And I want to see how much better at it everybody <laughs> else is than me. There's one of my cats. Wonderful has um if anybody wants any of that i can put it in a jiffy bag and send it out to you it's everywhere all the time so naturally tonight i've, I've chosen a black shirt a great great move there from me um cool so i've got my little palette uh which is completely washed out in my lights here uh i'm not helping myself by doing that at all okay cool doesn't matter uh i've got my this is the game color that i was telling you about so game color from vallejo and i've also got game air color if you're ever interested in these and haven't ever kind of looked into them before uh the different color lids uh, are the way of identifying uh, at first hand then of course air kind of gives it away uh but generally black lids for um airbrush uh gray lids for brush <laughs> i was putting these in my airbrush and i was i, I remember i actually had um adrian coming over uh, to my house a couple of years back going oh, i'm not going to get an airbrush but they're going to clog up like that all the time dude they don't uh, clog up i was using the wrong stuff um adrian has actually put in there he's currently working on a corn berserker army uh luke is, that, is, that, is uh, getting a cup of tea and then finishing an imperial knight <gasps> i would yeah, like to see both of these corn berserker army is that another name for, for blood angels is that Yes, it is. Why, why Blood Angels, Kyle? Tell me why, why Blood Angels. Uh, I just really like running it. I like that I don't have to think more tactically than how quickly can I get to the enemy to hit them with a thunder hammer uh, or a chain sword. Uh, I absolutely love dropping out of the sky or just magically bamping my way around a table and delivering slam captains and chaplains and death company um, to where they need to be. I think the models are fantastic. The death company and the seraphim, uh, what they called sanguinary guard absolutely fantastic models and that's pretty much all i try and use uh because of it i just love the way they look and i'll take anything i can that allows me to put more of them on the table <laughs> yeah i have actually um been on the receiving end of those we were talking about it earlier on we were playing um was it a t it was a tournament wasn't it that i'd, I'd run a couple of years back i'm sure it was a tournament no, it wasn't. No, because it was. It was. It was. Yeah, it was. It was a one-off, and it was a multiplayer, wasn't it? Because we were playing with some other friends. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd set up my tyranids. It was a team game, if I remember rightly. Uh, I set up my tyranids in a way where my synapse control um, basically was completely undeniable. I had complete control over the table and it was very very hard to get through me the only way to do it was to be coming from behind which you couldn't really do that easily from the offset and then come in and, and then kill me which kyle did before i even got to move because <laughs> you dropped your jump troops in behind me used some cards that i can't remember did it's what beautiful blood angel card i think uh, scent of angels off the top of my head just lets you just pretty much confirm charges and then there's one that just lets you reposition jump track so you literally track jumped troops. in from the skies <laughs> smashed my leader in the head with a giant hammer killed it outright uh which was a bit of a shocker to, to say the least and then <laughs> jumped away which doesn't normally happen before i could get back uh, and yeah before the game had even started the game was lost for me but i do remember then you flunking it for the rest of the game and it was very close wasn't it <laughs> Yeah, it was more, it just, I'd just taken nothing that could hold an objective. So I was doing fantastic amounts of damage uh, and, and just having some great moments around the board. But the game was all about holding objectives, which you can't really do with the Death Company because they're having daddy issues left, right and centre and don't really care about actually standing on uh, objectives. So can you, just in case, because I know for a fact 
um, that we've got some people that are interested in this show who may not necessarily be into the hobby. Uh, we've got a wonderful um, spread on the demograph, by the way. Um, so many people are interested in the show, which was which was heartwarming, really. But there are some people out there who may just not know what you mean by daddy issues. So I'm wondering if you could just explain what you mean. <laughs> So um, if you, you kind of got to take it back to Space Marines all have basically a gene defect. Um, the, the Blood Angels one is that they're vampires, but shh, don't tell anyone. Nobody knows. Um, they, they've managed to keep it a secret. Even with all the blood drinking, no one's really clicked, which is quite nice. But basically they're, they're Primark, the person that they all come from, the big super daddy Space Marine that they're all kind of made from. Uh, he died fighting Horus uh, um, during the Horus heresy where they all split. And some blood angels get visions of him fighting and dying, um, and it drives them crazy. Uh, I didn't so they know that. I thought yeah. I knew a lot, but I don't. So they slap him in, in. So they're crazy. There's no way back for them. All they're all they're doing is assuming that they are the daddy of blood angels. Um, they they go into that mode. They go crazy. So they slap him in black armor, and they just push him to the front of the line and. Off they go in a, in a blaze of glory because there's no coming back from them, unless you're Mephiston, which is a different story. Entirely, altogether. absolutely, yeah. Lives waiting mm-hmm. for the enemy to come to them while they hold it. They have to go out there and totally annihilate everything. Um, and of course, that does lead into some some issues. It does. There, there's definitely balanced ways to play Blood Angels. I know in Eighth Edition they were actually quite a strong what they call meta. They were they were doing well at, across tournaments and things like that. But it just, just didn't interest me. Um, I just wanted to take elite troops and just run at people uh, and try and make names for every single one of my Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of um, painting, you know, not painting, sorry, but, but playing the game to the narrative, to what, what you find the better, what you find. It doesn't have mm. to be all about the tournament, you know, play to win. Um, if you do, that is an absolutely valid mm. way of playing, and that should that should not be taken away from you at all. And uh, there are some there are some crazy gamers out there who just know the. I actually know an individual um, who just just knows that has absorbed the rules uh, to a point where he can just go. Oh, I'm going to put this in here uh, alongside this unit, so it's just going to make the perfect combination, and you're yeah. not going to be able to take it down. And then we weren't able to because um, a soul was it a soul grinder uh, with the mark of corn uh, is unstoppable. Um, and when we learned how to deal with it, if you put two of those features on the board, you're never going to be able to tackle it. So, yeah, that was a I way of sticking it in and breaking it off. It's just having that conversation, making sure yeah. your two players playing for the same reason. Because it can get, I think that's when you find people getting frustrated, is if you're quite a, a story-driven player. Yeah. Uh, trying to play someone who's quite a meta player. That's when it can get a little bit frustrating. And all it takes is a quick conversation. And you very well might find out um, that they might want to play the other way as well. Like just saying, fantastic. This I don't don't play a competitive army. This is just about putting models on the table. I like the look. Yeah, of. absolutely. Uh, and that's how, funnily enough, how I started when I started playing back in ninety three, ninety four. Um, it was a little bit after I started secondary school, so it must have been around 93, 94, early 94, late 93 perhaps. Um, and I didn't actually know how to play the game, and I was very fortunate that my best friend, who, the guy who I shared this house with, um, just happened to... He's one of those people that can just read the rules and just just remembers everything about it. Um, and I have to say that as a, as a player, even now, I exploit that. I'm very sorry, Mark. I know you're listening. I know you're watching right now. Um, but... It's, it's easy to do when, you, when, you, when you're in a pinch, when you're in a bind and you want to know the rules. If someone knows it, then you go along with it. Um, so I just played with everything that I liked. It didn't have to fit, rhyme or reason. Uh, and for years, uh, Mark tolerated that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, while he utterly decimated me with his ranks of Eldar for like 10 years solid. Um, but at no point did we not have fun. I'm sure I might have been sour after like my umpteenth loss. Um but, you know, we carried on playing because it, it's a game and it's all about what you want to get out of it as a player. Um, and if, you know, you're struggling to find those players, then you need to branch out a little bit and go and find other people. Tournaments, man. Uh, so I used to run tournaments. You've been in a, a one or two of the tournaments I run. I used to run them for my friends um, like once every year. Uh, they would take, even though there was only a few of us playing, it's about six or seven of us playing, they'd take quite a long time to get through. Um 
Uh, I don't think I ever actually um, finished in first place at any of them, uh, but we had a crack in time. Um, and after a while, you know, there, there were people that were playing very, very competitively and other people couldn't keep up. So I had to put in rules to say like, hey, maybe maybe we should not have any of these units so that we don't, you know, make it unenjoyable or whatever. And then we started getting into like really kind of um, story driven narrative um, tournaments. So we were like kind of combining the two worlds. And some of the some of the stories that I'd taken away from that were um, some of the, the finest <laughs> stories that I remember to now. Um, I've actually got a Space Marine model, unfortunately not, not in this room, that I've marked under his base with a piece of blue tack because he held a winning, a, a crucial objective fighting uh, a friend who was playing against me in the Tau who set up an immense gun line uh, and was just basically providing, uh, uh, you're just denying areas of the board where there were points to hold. And as long as I wasn't holding it, I think he could maintain a draw. So I had to hold it. I had to take it from him. Um, and that Space Marine um, morale broke. Um, so for people who don't know what that necessarily means, it means that basically he got intimidated to a degree and decided that it was probably in his best interests to not stay there. Um, but Space Marines are not scared. In fact, they actually know no fear. That is their main concept. They are religious, super genetic warriors. They, they, it's bred out of them trained out of them and bred out of them so he wasn't scared he just realized that staying there was not the best thing to do instantly rallied his morale when he left and then came back to hold that uh, position four times and then stayed there as the only individual left in my army um or that that portion of the army anyway uh, against the entire opponent's army um and stood behind a pillar while it got uh, the, the wreck shot out of it basically um and it was just one of those things that has been <laughs> a topic of conversation between me and my friends for such a long time because everyone would come over and watch the individual tournaments being played, even if it was just between a couple of people. Which is why I like the hobby so much, because it just brings people together. Obviously not the people who don't enjoy the hobby, it's, it's not for them. But, you know, it's, it's nice to kind of have that, that social gathering. We've got some comments going in here. Um... Uh, uh, so, Mellibrook. Mellibrook, I believe, is my friend Mark. Uh, he says, it was the oops, did the dreadnought fall off the table again tactic that was most upsetting. Yes, uh, I will, in the global commons, put my hand up and admit that, that it was a long time ago, right? And I was a kid. But the uh, Eldar, what is now the uh, Wraith Lord, was called the dreadnought, which is basically a, a giant robot thing that uh, is controlled by... Um, dead people, essentially, the spirits of the fallen. Uh, El Eldar are essentially space elves. Um, uh, and it is a construct that will just walk across the battlefield and destroy lots of things. Um, but back in those days, of course, these models were made out of metal, uh, were heavy, uh, were hard to put together, uh, and if they took um, any amount of damage, they would often fall apart. Now, on some occasions, Mark, I'm going to have to say that it was an accident. But after I learned that it was an easy way to annoy you i think i probably did that on purpose but you probably already know that anyway so yeah often it would be a leg standing on its own on a base um, i have matured as a individual and as a player uh, so my apologies that will never happen again i promise I promise. Uh, Adrian's also about to have a comment here. For more info on the law, I would recommend uh, Lutin09. Um, I, is that a, a, a YouTube um, channel feature thing where we can um, go and listen to someone telling us stories? I don't. I don't know. There's a lot of a lot of law behind 40k. That's what I really like about it. Is it's just so deep. You can go on for hours and hours and hours i think that's a good point to make as well is we don't know everything about the warhammer 40,000 or warhammer fantasy universe and no we don't absolutely chime in especially if we get stuff wrong which i'm I'll sure tell, will. tell you where i don't know an awful lot about particularly is the 30k realm so like going back to the heresy um 
Yeah, it's so nothing I've ever really been in. I started that reading into. the novels, but then, um, well, you know, pandemic and then life and certain other things got in the way. But I started reading. I've only read the first one, and there's like a million of them out there. But Horace Rising is supposed to be the, like the first story or the first book in the story of the heresy. Um, and it was a really good read. It was a really good read um, because obviously it's 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 before chaos, really, or before the, the, the space marine, chaos space marines. It's about how they became to be. Um, so, yeah, that was um, that was really good because all the bad guys that are in the law are all good. They haven't fallen yet. And I was like, wow, these are actually really deep characters um, like Abaddon. Do we call it Abaddon? Or Abaddon. I call him Abaddon because I think Abaddon sounds a bit daft, but maybe I'm getting that wrong. Maybe it sounds a little bit like he's a bad one. I don't. Maybe that's just my my Britishness getting in the way there. I, I don't know. I mean, answers on a postcard, right? Um, but yeah, he's like. There is no prize. There is no prize. Don't don't. No no no. <laughs> no. Um, well, honor, glory, perhaps. But yeah, um, he's like a really charismatic guy. Um, I mean, he's, you know a killer because he's a soldier but yeah oh, it was a really good book basically horace writings the first in a, in a trilogy that kind of launches and kickstarts the um the uh horace heresy novels um and I, I would like to get back into them. i've got the second one uh, my partner actually was kind enough to buy me the um the pdf book the ebook for it and i started and then yeah well you know the world turned upside down i don't want to get too far into that of course because this channel i really want it to be something where we can all put away the worries and the stress of the world uh the politics and you know the pandemic and whatever's going on we can leave that at the threshold and come and enjoy something that we all get a lot out of i just want to say a big hello to luke as well for joining in uh he's actually my brother and, uh. um, hi luke he's actually a good inspiration of why i want to paint he has absolutely outstripped me as a painter over the years he's put the time in i've watched his his first fledging attempts at painting all the way up to now um hopefully he'll put some pictures up of the knights so he's currently painting the imperial knights they i'd love to see them fantastic um and has left me completely in the dirt the only way i've managed to take revenge is that he's just learning 40k so uh, i was able to use my blood angels to pound him into the dirt whilst he didn't know all the rules like a good big brother i didn't tell him the rules i let him come out <laughs> the hard way as uh he worked out what it is blood angels do the best yeah with his sisters of battle i believe he's been sporting and just started an, an eldar force as well which is coming along and some looking nice really sharp some some nice choices there uh and that's i uh, i really like about warhammer 40k is the is the amount of different races that there are out there um the, the game in some ways and this could be a negative thing maybe it maybe it's not um it, it has fallen it's best described to me by a friend as the imperium and some people for them to fight it is a little bit easy to kind of get carried away with the imperium which is basically the humans. Uh, so there's all the different types of Imperial Guard regiments, and then there's all the different types of Space Marines. And they've all got their own flavours, and they've all got their own things, but it can be a little bit oversaturated with one with one stereotype such. But there's so many other things out there, like the Tau and the Necrons, uh, you know, and, and the Eldar. And then there's the Sisters of Battle. They play, obviously, into the Imperium as well, but they're... Um, They've actually got quite a big following, and obviously they've been re recently relaunched. I I think that yeah, it'd be really interesting they to have see them. Some really interesting, I think, flavorful rules. There's a lot of, yeah, you know, I'm going to get this wrong. I think there are prayers. Like each unit could do different things depending on kind of what they did. Um, my brother just told me he pistol whipped one of my tanks. I'd like to point out that pistol that he used was a melter pistol. So I don't think it was actually a pistol whipping. No, um, no, that's that's <laughs> it. Yeah, he literally shot lava <laughs> at a tank, at a tank. If it's yeah the time okay. i remember cool um but yeah but yeah it was it was a really interesting and i kept having to go to him and i feel really bad for it but i was like you can do what what can you get to do huh i want to see that in the rule book um because they could just do so many interesting things um and afterwards i kind of thought to myself well actually no they've kept it in line with the fluff and uh, it actually it, it did work really well for them these are meant to be righteous a righteous holy order of sisters um, and that's kind of exactly how they played off with crazy pentient engines coming at you and all sorts of nastiness. Like even for a combat army, I didn't really want to touch too close in combat. So, 
Yeah. Interesting, interesting game. I, I would game. be really interested, Luke, to to see yeah, your 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 work, whatever stage it's at, especially this uh, this Imperial Knight. Uh, I'm not necessarily a, a massive fan of playing really big units um, in 40k, um, but there is a there is a place for them. Uh, and the game over since maybe seventh edition, but definitely eighth. I say I haven't really played ninth at all. Um, has started to cater to um, the player in you can do whatever you want. If you want it to be a game of apocalypse where you've got massive city-sized units just stride across the battlefield eliminating 40 guys with one stare, then you can play that. If you are a fan, um, and it's only because I started in those days, but if you're a fan of the small skirmish games where you take a couple of units, maybe a dreadnought or a tank, uh, and very rarely would you ever take both, um, it's all about the smaller units. Uh, the, the game caters for that too. And you can just kind of play whatever you want so if you're if you're into massive armies or just a couple of guys and you want to go down to kill teams which is just like single units then then the game caters for you and i think that that was probably the the healthiest move that i think um gw ha- has done in in their rule sets now i'm, I'm gonna uh, bring up something here i might be barking up the wrong tree entirely um <laughs> ruben's just put spore mines i love spore mines i'm gonna come back to these in a minute um what was I saying? I've completely lost my track. <laughs> nope, we're going to come back to that in a bit. Um, one of the things I like that Games Workshop has done, I'm actually really excited for for ninth. once I can finally find some time uh, and some people down my neck of the woods to play on, is the uh, Crusade. So it is starting off with a smaller army, and it's all about getting your requisition points, you build up your traits, and it's, it's that bridging between role play and the tabletop game again i think it's just giving you that little bit more flavor to the games to build nice. up tournament narrative style that's really games. cool Talk, i've done some reading up on that and that yeah you've got made it, it flavorful for each each army as well you Being mentioned tap- um ninth edition which has completely reminded me of the lost track i had there nice. which is um and this plays right into our hand doing this um, show here, which is I seen and I have not confirmed that there is a new rule in 40k 9th edition. And that rule is, is that you are allowed so many um, victory points to acquire throughout the game for various things. And I think that you are allowed a total of... Um, 45 or was it 90 i can't remember i I literally read it um on the fly and i can't i can't remember the entire thing basically it gives you um x amount of victory points which could be a winning scenario um if your army is completely painted so even games workshop if this is a real rule and i'm sure that there's probably someone watching right now who has the book and and knows for sure that this might just be a load of rubbish um but that is that is potentially gw reaching out saying hey paint your armies so gray marines absolutely um for all of the opportunity they they give us to have such a a vast array of colors even in the same army types be it space marines green blue red black you know whatever you want uh we always seem to choose the same color and that's gray because it's easy now i know that the the effect of not 10 victory points for a fully painted army perhaps i can goes a long way it it, Well, it certainly did in um, the games that we played. Yeah, I say we haven't played ninth yet, but that is, so that's actually a confirmed thing. Then, brilliant. I want to make that maybe um, like our our motto for this show: ten victory points ten victory for a fully points. painted army. Yeah, cool. So, how does it then, Adrian? I know that there's a there's a stream delay here, so there's going to be a little bit of um, time while we're waiting for you to reply and then obviously type. Um, but how? How is it governed? How much of your army has to be painted? Is there a minimum sort of colour set that you have to have? Because it used to be that you play in tournaments, you have to have at least three decent amounts of colours uh, beyond the you know the, uh, the priming. So you would prime your colour, and then you would go, oh, the main colour is going to be green with uh, red accents and uh, yellow highlights. So I mean, you just spit balling colours out here. Um, uh, Ruben's putting in... Uh, your 10 points for a, per, for a painted army total possible points for a game are 100 yeah I thought I'd read that right 10% swing Look, it really is know. so if it's literally if you're level pegging and you know I've got my unpainted tyranids against Kyle's 10 space marines because it you know it's all he needs to take and he smash captained me or whatever as it always goes but yeah. we're we're on par then uh, he's going to win because his army's painted so uh you know, like, subscribe the channel, and uh, get those victory points in, yeah? 
it's, so, it's the part of the victory points. Yeah, that's how I won my games. Um, by the way, like I never, I'm not the greatest tactician, but I always, always kept in mind um, my objectives um, because I know for a fact that it's very easy to get carried away with uh, totally eliminating the enemy. Um, that is a perfectly um, reasonable thing to want to do because if you do wipe everybody out, you win automatically. But if you can make them pay for it, if you can make them fight for it, um, then they tend to kind of forget about the objectives. Now, I know that I am uh, live broadcasting my tactics here to the whole world, and people are going to be, oh, yeah, right, cool, so he relies on this. But, you know, it, it was it was often, I'm going to throw out a random statistic here, say about 90% of my victories were basically just because um, I was able to divert attention away from the objective until the last minute, and it was too late. Um, and, you know, I've kind of, like, surrounded certain things with, you know, umpteen amounts of gene stealers which i would be very interested to know what our audience prefers gene stealers or hormogon so if you're a tyranid fan out there um it, i'm a fan of the hormogon i come back from uh, from the second edition rules where hormogons were the small horse super fast bit weak but would claw you up bad I use them now to get in fast, tie up the enemy. They probably all die, but by the time you've dealt with them, then the gene stealers are in. However, I find that gene stealers are faster, so they kind of negate the ob you know, the, the whole point of having a hormogon. Um, because you can just get in super fast with a super elite unit, uh, and they've got a much um, higher chance of surviving, um, and they're just death on legs. So there's no point in having a hormogon. You might as well spend the points on something else. But again, playing to what you like, I always take the hormogons. So yeah. Uh, so what's Adrian put down here? Blood Angels or any red army? Mephiston red, Carabao crimson, and Evil Suns red count as your three colours. So it is about having those <laughs> matters, about having those colours down there. But hey, if those are separate colours and you can call them out from the paint pots, then uh, yeah, brilliant. Uh, my dad's put in there rippers. Yeah, rippers. I love rippers. Um, he actually bought me for a present a long time ago, um, and it's a subject for another day. Uh, the Forge World Rippers, which just look amazing. Those sculptors over at Forge World are just incredible. Um, and they make it look like rather than just having a couple of little um, dog sized uh, things on the, um, on the on the base, that you've actually got screaming hordes trying to climb over you know, the, the, the others in the unit, trampling themselves to death. Uh, because they're fearless, fearless units, and they just um, don't care about themselves. Just to kind of get in there, I like rippers. Um, they're often an afterthought for me because they're quite cheap. I like to put them in at the end if I've got points spare. Uh, but they're really good for just swamping enemy positions down, uh, especially if you've got like um, an elite shooting unit and you can secret them in on the side somehow. Um, that the unit that's often really good at shooting isn't necessarily equipped to take out in close combat massive amounts of rippers. Um, so they're really good for that. But uh, yeah, spore mines. So ha, I have completed my very basic task today of getting some yellow on all of my spore mines here. I'm going to go back over them because I say that these um, these paints that I'm using, even though I am using the brush one, are quite thin. And on some of them, the ones that I haven't primed so well, um, the uh, base colours that I'm painting over or like the, the darkness of the old primers or whatever coming through, I want them to be quite bright and poppy. I'm going to um, stain these. Uh, I use the word stain. It was probably a defunct term, but I'm going to wash them as such with a, a shade, which I like to use um, sepia. Uh, I used to use, uh, I think it was Agrax Earth Shade. Um, and I lost it, and then I experimented with the sepia, and I found them on this yellow scheme that, that actually is quite indistinguishable to tell them apart. Uh, I did do a little bit of investigation, was talking to some guys on, on a forum on Facebook, um, you know, what is the difference? I kind of, I find it quite imperceptible, um, but some people are telling me that on paler colours, like whites and pale creams and things like that, that they are actually quite easy to tell apart. But for this colour, um, sepia, or the Agrax Earthshade, which is just a nice brown, inky kind of colour, um, I just like it to kind of run in and affect the colour and run into all the creases um, and because these are, again are such a small unit I'm not really that fussed about them being 100% perfect um, I do actually have to go back to the ones at the beginning because these ones are still slightly wet and I'm just moving wet paint around which I don't want to do cool, uh, do you call it Kyle sepia or sepia? 
Sepia. Sepia. Is I'm going to say sepia. Yeah, I use sepia, but I hear a lot of people um, saying sepia, and I understand that these people are from America, and that we, uh, though we are very similar, we are worlds apart, and we have different ways of saying things, and it might just be an, an, a, a British-American thing, or I might just be saying it wrong, in which case, yeah. to all those fans of sepia, I apologise. I think it's one of those words I've only ever read and never really heard said out loud, so I think I've just stuck with the first way the word I read you it say in it. my head. Yeah, fair. Yeah. I do that Sepia. a lot. Do you ever find that you get called out on a word and you're like, oh, I don't think I've ever actually heard it yeah. said out before. Whoops. Yeah, that's I'm that's for sure, that for sure. Head. So, just trying to get a decent amount of coverage on these. <clears throat> I think it's time for me to have a drink because I am talking and talking. And, uh, yeah, I get a bit of a dry throat. This morning I had my breakfast. And before the show happened, I had like a, a, a dust moat of bran flake lodge in my throat uh, right before the show started. Uh, I could not for the life of me stop coughing. I was crying. I was like, yeah, of course, on on the debut launch, of course it would happen. So I'm, this paint on here is, um, I thought it was quite warm in this room. Uh, I've got a lot of things generating a lot of heat here. Uh, I thought these would dry quite quickly. They're taking their time. So I'm just going to let that settle for a minute. I've got some nice Lucas Aid support coloured water now. Um, I'm gonna, I I'm gonna have a drink. very nearly ended up collecting Tyranids purely off the back of one of my favourite films, which was Starship Troopers. Um, after watching Starship Troopers and already being into Warhammer 40k, I was like, oh my god, that's just Tyranids. Um, yeah. And I and so, very closely went to, a, almost went to a swarm army. It's a like really interesting uh, point of discussion. By the way, Starship Troopers, amazing film. Incredible book, which is entirely Absolutely. different, entirely different from the film. Uh, and they both are standalone um, pieces. I recommend both of them highly. Um, but Starship Troopers uh, created a bit of a, a bad name for the Tyranids in some way. I, I remember it actually being an article in the White Dwarf magazine, which is obviously the uh, the Games Workshop message board i suppose before the, the days of the internet really um well they actually after starship troopers became super famous especially amongst tyranid players um that people started calling them bugs and i still do and i know that uh, a lot of my close friends and family still call them bugs um because it, just that concept just that idea of having lots of you know swarming aliens that are just for you know, for what it appears just trying to just kill you for the sake of killing you um it played right into the into the camp of you know, playing Tyranids. Why, why not? But actually, in the law of the game, Tyranids are supposed to not just be these, you know, really alien-looking creatures. They are super intelligent, and they understand. They don't communicate with us. They don't um, uh, talk to us. Um, there are people that are, like, psychic that say um, that they can understand the message i suppose that they, that they have um but they don't they don't have a language or anything so they come across as quite um you know just animalistic but they absorb genetic data by eating human brains or you know the brains of their enemies and, and acquiring their tactical information they have a, a, a grand scope of tactics and, and and battlefield strategy um they're just completely and utterly uh, devoted to destroying um anything that stands in front of them because they want their next meal to move on. They're, they're a locust, but they are super intelligent. And I remember in White Dwarf, just after that film was released, that they had a, a battle report special uh, where they featured uh, Acadian Army, which is uh, an Imperial Guard, which is now called uh, Astra Militarum. Um, but the Imperial Guard are the human, just standard human troopers. Uh, and they look very, very similar to the troopers and starship troopers. And then they had the Tyranids, and they actually did what they called um, uh, Radchek's Roughnecks or Rico's Roughnecks. Um, and it was actually uh, a bunker assault, so it was in the center of the table, and you had all the Cadians in there, and then just just fast units of Tyranids, like Horvogons or whatever, and it was just how many turns can you survive? Um, and they were trying to make this um, kind of informative battle report at the same time by saying like they still have this animalistic drive but at the same time they are hyper intelligent and it was just a, a brilliant way to cash in on a solid film i mean Jeanette's just put into the uh, chat there that she loves the film it just stands even to this day it's just brilliant there's a few things in it where i go really what about this but it doesn't matter because guns and ammo and aliens right it's that that's that's all you need it's a brilliant film I, I didn't like the follow-up so much i have heard that they are making a series which i should imagine has probably been um uh 
stuck with the pandemic, but we're not going to really go into that very much. But uh, yeah, I I love the film, and yeah, like I say, it's a 200 player. It's just aliens, isn't it? Lots of claws, lots of teeth. I loved it. Absolutely brilliant. Don't forget the humble throwing knife. Uh, you talk about weapons in uh, in that film. Someone posted a picture on a forum on Facebook uh, with the new um, Primaris Marines, one holding a throwing knife and another guy <laughs> up against a wall with that very quote <laughs> right underneath it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, Brilliant, brilliant film, brilliant acting, uh, just great special effects, uh, just <laughs> goofy goofy but not goofy i remember watching it and laughing but ultimately being terrified brilliant loved it i love that there's even a little crossover between another one of my favorites is the armor from that the, the uh mobile infantry war ended up in firefly in or second episode of firefly, firefly. it was actually supposed yes, it to was it not, it wasn't supposed to be the first one it was the train heist wasn't it and that was yeah, either that was either supposed them. to be the first one or it was the second one but for some reason the network had just flipped them over because they were better. And ultimately that's been attributed to the failure of the thing. Um, my heart still bleeds for the loss of that program. So if you're out there watching, um, I know that there have been some unfortunate losses in the actors, but please bring that back, please. You know, Serenity was, was a great film, but it was not the way that we all want to see that story end. love it. Absolutely love it. Brilliant. I have seen, I can't confirm because it's just something quickly today actually, was that I think there's going to be a graphic novel uh, based on Firefly to actually try and wrap that incredible story up properly. It was going um, places, wasn't it? It really was. Yeah, yes, that would be great. Was. I've also got some tea over here, made a cup of tea, because uh, if you're American, uh, this is how I do this. <laughs> I don't drink coffee, I'm a tea fan. I've also got to agree with Adrian, this Astra Militarum, yeah. you know, Imperial Guard. welcome to the guard sign, here's your flashlight. I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe that the reason they armor. did that was um, because obviously they were they were treading on the toes of the uh, the property of Disney with um, Star Wars, which I totally get. And if you're a long-standing fan of 40k like myself, and I'm sure Adrian is, and and you are, that it, that it has to be the Imperial Guard for me. But I, I get it, Astra Militarum, call it what you want, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jeanette's put down me both. Uh, I now want to watch Star Troopers and Firefly. Uh, aging yes. i should imagine again i uh, just bumped into my webcam uh yeah no you're right um and you should because they're great and they are they're just I've got but say... seriously read the book you, it's, it's a really small book and it's not if you haven't read it it doesn't go how you think it is it's not an action um biopic like the film is following a couple of people in the unit um it's, it's a very political book uh, and it goes into some really uh interesting concepts uh, of socialism and, and, and communism and, and and things like that and it's and though i don't want to get universal suffrage was the big yeah one i don't want to bring the don't want to bring the discussion down but <laughs> it's um it's yeah it's and, and that's why though they are the same story essentially they are worlds apart um and they're both excellent they're both standalone yeah go watch that film go read that book it's a really small book yeah, I think I read it and I picked it up, got hooked by it and read it in a day. day. It's really it's a easy. Book. Yeah, it's, it's almost a pamphlet. It's a novella almost. Yeah. Um, uh, Robert A. Heinlein is the um, is the author of that uh, and written a very long time ago, actually. A lot of people don't realise it. I think it was actually written in the 50s. I could be wrong. I think it was late 50s it was written. Uh, this is where someone on the internet goes. Actually, it was uh, 1997. Uh, <laughs> like, okay, cool. Yep, brilliant. Right. How are you getting on, Kyle? Uh, I'm going to flip us over away from the workbench so we can have a little look at what you're doing over there. So I'm going to come to well, your kind of, webcam. What have you got? I was working on the cape. I don't think we're going to be able to see very well with my quality of camera. Okay. We'll get some photos in later for the Facebook, yeah? Yeah. What I've worked on is a red cape, red back of the cape, just trying to work on. I got a base down. Uh, well, two bases because I went quite watery on purpose because I made that mistake last time of, of having too thick of a paint. Um, washed it. And then I've dry brushed over the top. I've made a bit of a rookie error. I think I've just done them a little bit too close together in kind of rushing this evening. Um, but still, it's coming. I can see the effect I'm trying to achieve is there, which is nice. And again, um, with the L-Line Reaver, it's the same idea. It's very dark. Cause I was going to say it looks very dark. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, I can see it, though. I can see it. Me. Yeah, yeah. And I've just been working up on some layers of green there. I think I started off with uh, Caliban Green. Then I went to a warpstone glow. I washed it with a bile. Is it bile tan green? I can never say that Eldar name. Again, these are uh, words that they're made up, aren't they? So you yeah, can you can just say how you want. I always call it bile tan. 
Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, why not? Beal tan uh, as a wash and a quick um, dry brush again with the warp. Is Beal tan actually actually a shade or a wash itself, or have you washed yeah, it, it down? Yeah, it's actually a, a oh, ideal. Okay, in, cool. In itself as well. So just give that a wash down. That's not come up. Uh, as much as I wanted it to, so I'm just going to work that shade in again. Um, and I've actually got a highlight, an edge highlight for the both of them. I've got an, a nice troll slayer orange. Might go wild rider red for the for the cape and a moot green for the for the green as well. Just really light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Edge really, really bright. Highlights. If you want to go really vibrant greens, almost consider going into the yellows. When I did that um, uh, acid base. Um, I've actually set like five, uh, a range of like five or six colours, going right down from really, really dark bottle green, which I think might be dark angels green or Caliban green, potentially. I don't know the Citadel range so well, but the really dark bottle greens and just work your way up to the point where they're almost fluorescent yellow and you can kind of blend them. And, and because they're so closely uh, linked, yellow and green, they, they really draw up uh, in, in, nice. in the, in the colour. Um, like I say, if you, the, unfortunately these lights aren't that great for really seeing my brood lord but um, if you look at the photos on the facebook i've just kind of put up a, a couple of photos up there to get started um i i will put some more photos of the actual base up proper close so you can see it um uh, that might be not where you're going oh we've got some more people joining in now we've got stafford damn you have to paint station set up now and i hate painting but are you actually painting that's what we want to know if you are painting right now because of this channel then we have succeeded our mission is complete we can end the stream and never carry on ever again that's never going to happen we're going to carry on regardless uh, uh adrian's uh put in there try non wash uh, to shade your green yeah good idea um I when I first started getting back into really kind of painting, I I did that. It's, it's a rookie thing, uh, I think, but it has a place, and that is literally saturating everything in a wash. I started doing that with my yellow schemes. Uh, washes are really, you, you can use them however you want to, but I see a lot of marine players doing a lot of um, pin striping, so they're like uh, putting it in really fine detail brushes um, to kind of put it into like the recesses of shoulder pads or wherever you want to, so it's not running wild all over the place, so you don't have to control this this goopy mess all over the place. But with the Tyranids, I wanted something that was biological. I wanted those uh, you know, randomly flesh tones, and because the aliens, we don't know that. You know, do they have rosy cheeks or elbows? We don't know. Um, so I just kind of let it go and then and then brighten them up. And I I dry brush them gently over a period of time uh, with the same yellow that uses the base, just to kind of bring the colours back out again. So the, the that brown wash was kind of blended down down in the layers a little bit. And I didn't do anything else with it. That, that is literally all I did. And I started putting up the pictures on the Facebook page. Um, and even though they're a bit rough because it's a horde army and you're not going to do precision work on every single unit, every single model on every unit. Um, it looks really effective. And I was just like, yeah, it's, this, this is really good. It's cool. Uh, Mellibrook has put one victory point for having a paint station set up. Absolutely. I will give that. If you've got a paint station better than mine, which is literally a piece of chipboard placed across two chairs while I'm sat on a bench that the seat isn't actually fixed down on, then you can have a point because you're doing better than me. So yeah, Cool. Right. Well, I'm going to go back to the workbench now because I'm trying to wait for this yellow here to dry. And uh, yeah, we're getting close to the end. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave these here for now. We've done a lot of talking tonight, uh, a lot more talking than what I probably wanted to do. But first episode, man, we'll get back into this. We'll paint some more. Um, I'm going to do some more of these over the week. Um, and I will obviously have an, another episode next week, uh, Friday, um, 7 till 9 GMT. You tune in wherever you are in the world. You can always watch it back if you don't have time. Um, if I haven't got to do, doing these, I will finish these off next week, where there will probably be a little less talking to start with. But, you know, stuff to discuss. If you have kids and you want to bring those along, this isn't necessarily set up to, you know directly for kids but if you want to um, bring your kids along so you can paint with them then uh, Kyle and myself are absolutely committed to making this a family friendly um, show so you can rest assured that there's going to be no cussing <laughs> or anything like that or talking inappropriately obviously there are themes of war <laughs> we have to get around that one yourselves um, but yeah by all means please you know, bring bring people along get someone involved in the hobby who hasn't normally 
you know would normally do something like this and see if you can get them painting and, and enjoying maybe not just the gaming maybe it's just maybe it's just the the painting maybe it's just the really rich storylines that kind of bring you in i know that's what really keeps me hooked is that the uh, the plots and the stories i find are just fantastic so let's talk about um the the immediate future and what we think we can do with this program i would really like to keep this going i'm certainly going to keep it going for a while um it doesn't just have to be on fridays i put fridays because i thought that fridays were a great day to have it because generally um, it's the end of the week people haven't necessarily got a lot of work commitments and it's the start of the weekend so get some stuff ready for maybe a saturday game if that's if that's how you're going to go um but I don't just have to do this one particular thing. I, could, I can do specials. I'm certainly going to do like festive or seasonal specials. So for like Christmas Eve, I'm going to do one. I'm going to do your New Year's Eve and things like that. If you want a, a bit of company during some of these these times, then then I'm going to be here providing it right up to that up to the last minute. Um, I can do um, shows about uh, sculpting. I have very limited um, skills in sculpting, but it's something that I'd like to do because I'd like to do some conversions with green stuff, and I've got various putties and stuff to play around with. Um, if you want to do terrain features, I would like to get quite heavily involved in terrain because obviously that's where my background really kind of pays in. It's from from my dad and his company, and I've done a little bit. I've actually got a couple of um, resin terrain features down here. Uh, here is one. This is sculpted by my dad. You can actually buy this through Purple Lions. I'm not trying to throw out another advert or a call out or anything, but this is obviously something that I stole from the uh, from the workshop the last time I was up there. Uh, if I go back to the workbench, you can see it again. Um, so this here is this is a resin molded um, crater, like a little stack. I think it looks like a little sulfur stack or something. Um, and he's done quite a few of these, like different designs, different sizes, quite small ones, huge ones. Uh, flat ones tall ones whatever um, he's got all sorts of like rocky formations he's a really really good sculptor and uh, this was what he did to kind of jump start his his company again was just by selling a few of these um, so I'm quite happy to do a channel where we just talk about terrain and we do alien landscapes or we do you know futuristic city things or whatever and we kind of get the because that's another thing that's kind of left behind isn't it in the world of painting is that we um we spend so much time on our armies that we often play in a grey landscape. No more. Let's let's put that behind us. Let's let's get let's get the world looking bright and colourful. So if you if you want a separate channel for doing different things, then we can do that. I've also got that. I was going to bring it out, but we've done so much show and tell. I've got a 135th uh, Panther. Um, I've never ever painted a 135th um, scale model before. I'm really excited. It. I recently had my 39th birthday just at the end of October. Happy birthday to me. Um, and my dad actually kind of bought me this this panther model i was going to do it as like a special but i'm actually i'm going to do that on myself that's that's going to be for me i'm going to have a lot of fun putting it together however if there are enthusiasts out there who would really like to like have a special episode where we just do a model in that scale maybe it's a specific model that we all work together on then drop your comments in and uh i'd be, I'd be more than happy to, to do something and discuss something like that what I'm trying to say is, is that there's lots of scope for so much more. Um, and if you've got ideas, then I'm all ears. That rhymes. I'm not a poet. Um, anything for you, Kyle, while we finish off? No, um, I, I will try and learn to smile uh, during this. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> um, I'm not the biggest smiler. And also, maybe a reposition of the camera so when I'm painting, you're not just staring at the top of my bald little head. Um but no, it's been great. It's just been nice to actually carve out some time to paint. And that's exactly what this yeah. is for. Um, and just chat with people with similar interests. Um, and it's been really nice just, just having people comment. It's been really nice just chatting to some people again. Absolutely. Exactly yeah, I've I've not done much here apart from just blabber on. I, I expect to get a lot more done tonight, um, but I'm going to do a little bit more work on these over the next couple of days. I now got the weekend where I've actually got a few things planned, but straight back in as the week starts. Um, you know, the pandemic is still holding us down here in the UK. So I'm going to crack on with these um, and I'm going to start. I might do another coat of yellow, get some stain on them. Uh, and I'm going to put up pictures of progress of my stuff on Facebook. If you've got pictures, I want to see them. Kyle wants to see them. We all want to see it. So please, by all means, uh, get all that stuff up there. Um, but for now, uh, it is the end of our two-hour slot. We've probably gone over just by a minute or so. If you've watched uh, with us for any length of time, especially right from the beginning, thank you very much. Uh, I've really enjoyed putting this together, and I've, I was really, really nervous. And now I'm just it's just rolling and I'm clicking. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. And I hope to see you all again and Kyle, hopefully, 
uh, next week, uh, Friday, Thanks, at 7 till 9 GMT. Thanks very much. Someone's, someone's put in there. Well done, guys. Thank you very much. Cheers. Uh, that's, that's it from us. So thank you very much and see you again.